Good morning, and thank you for watching again this week with us. I'm looking forward to the, today's message from Philippians. But before we get to that, I have a few announcements, and then we want to have a word of prayer. If you are not getting our emails, we would love to include you on our email list. And um, you can get included by either contacting me, letting me know. I'll be happy to add your name to the email list. Or you can go to our church website, which is westsidebaptistchurch.org. Down at the bottom on the homepage, there's a place where you can sign up to be included in that. We're being very careful not to overload you with emails, so uh, each one that you get from us, we hope, has only the important and necessary information. So I would really appreciate it if you take the time to read through those if you're receiving them. And ladies, in particular, note that yesterday we sent an email out about a change uh, for Abby's wedding shower. And so uh, please remember that, and uh, we want you to be able to participate in that still, if at all possible. Then secondly, I really appreciate several of you who've asked about giving and have been uh, concerned about how to give and concerned for the, fi the church's finances. Um, you can mail your uh, offering to the church. Uh, the address, of course, is 2299 West, 2000 North, and that's St. George 84770. Uh, you could also bring that uh, to the church yourself if you're out. And if no one is here at the church, you can easily slide an envelope through uh, the front door uh, around the edge of that. And we'll come by and pick that up. If uh, you let us know that's here, we'll come as quickly as possible to get it. And those are secure. The building is uh, secure while we're not here. And then uh, some of you have online banking available. And uh, this is actually what I do with my giving. Um, I just have my online banking send a check to the church. They pay for postage, and many of your banks offer this as a free service. And so you may want to uh, find that as an alternative. Uh, and, of course, you can do online giving. There is a fee associated with that, but that fee may be worth it for you to pay uh, and certainly worth it for us to receive that from you. And so if that's what works best for you, then we're happy to receive online giving as well. Finally, I want to ask you to just be in prayer for our church, uh, that we would have wisdom for what the Lord would have us to do with our different ministries and our meetings. And we want to be careful and wise and obedient to the Lord. In light of that, we're not going to be having the meetings with uh, evangelist Jeremy Fraser. Their team is actually already dispersed, and they're not going to be coming this way. And so uh, we hope to have them again sometime in the future. But in the meantime, be praying for us to have wisdom about all of the ministries that we're involved in. And just ask the Lord to lead us in that. All right, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing. We want to pray for those that are starting to get sick from the coronavirus. Uh, praying also for all of you that have financial concerns and for our own church in that as well. And then also praying for uh, those in leadership that are making decisions about our health and about the economy. And finally, young people, we're praying for you. Uh, we know your school is uh, different, a lot of changes all the way from um, the lowest elementary grades, all the way up through college. We recognize that these are different days for you, and we're praying for you. We uh, love you, and we're concerned for you. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are gracious and kind, even in days like this where um, life seems in turmoil. There's a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. And uh, we also recognize that there are people who are experiencing symptoms of sickness and not only with coronavirus, but other issues in their lives. And we pray for one another that you would give health and strength and blessing. Father, we also pray for many in our church family that have financial concerns. Uh, some have um, had reduced hours and lower income, and some may even uh, have lost their jobs for now, and uh, some may never um, you know, get those jobs back and recover. And so we pray for them, Lord, that you would provide in other ways. 
I also pray for those in our state and on a federal level that are making decisions about health and our economy, that you would lead them, that you give wisdom, that you would use all of this for your glory and for your honor. And finally, we pray for our young people in our church. We ask that you would give help to them as they do school in a different way. And <clears throat> we pray, Father, that you would provide um, wisdom and help and environment and that you would meet the needs of all of our young people and that uh, they would be able to look back on this a time, as a time of learning and of blessing as you've worked in their hearts and in their lives. And so we hold them up before you today for your help and blessing. We pray now that you are blessed as we look into your word, that you'd be glorified in it, and that you would mold and change our hearts as a result of it. In Christ's name, amen. Last week, we looked in Romans at how we can have hope in times of distress. This week in Philippians chapter 4, I'd like us to see how we can have help in times of distress. This last week, our government passed legislation that was intended to help those who are and will be suffering financial loss. But for some people, that's going to be too little too late. Many of you have already seen a loss of income or loss of sales. Some of you have had your hours cut back, and some of you have even been laid off from work. There's some, some businesses in our town that are not going to survive these economic times. Several of you have watched your retirement funds be drastically cut, and now you're wondering if you're going to have enough to last you to the end. On top of that, some of you are going to get sick. Some of you uh, know people that are sick already, and death is a very realistic potential outcome for you. So maybe you're wondering, how is this all going to turn out? Will you be able to pay the bills? Will you be able to keep your car? Will you be able to stay in your house? Will you be able to buy food or stay healthy? Will God provide for you? And I think scripture gives us some answers for these kinds of questions. Philippians chapter 4. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved, I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full 
having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. As Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, he sits in jail. It's a first century jail with no similarity to our modern American prison system. Philippians is one of the four prison epistles that goes along with Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And this is important background information because it magnifies Paul's instructions to the believers to rejoice in the Lord always. Paul is being unjustly imprisoned, and yet he advises believers to rejoice. You see that in verse 4. And then he says, learn to relax. In verse 5 and 6, we're told not to worry, not to stress and fear, but be gentle and kind. And that relax is to show graciousness and have the right kind of thinking. And he follows that up in verse 8 with a list of things to, to think about. Then he says, in addition to rejoicing, relaxing, we should request from God. Make your request known to God. And in making a request known to God, we, we can ask him anything and then rest in the peace that he provides. And that peace that God gives is what he really wants us to know in these times of distress and and troubles, and even in the midst of suffering, we should be in a position where we could honor God by experiencing the peace that he provides for us. This peace is an internal peace. It's the kind of peace that God wants to affect our hearts, our minds, and as a result, as we think on these things that God has given to us, it should change our, our internal mind. It's an external peace as well. It should affect our relationships with other people. In this case, it should have affected even the Apostle Paul's relationship with his persecutors. In our case, in our homes, and especially as we spend more time in our homes with spouse and with children, this kind of peace that God gives us can have a positive effect on relationships with other people. But also, it's an eternal peace. It's eternal in the sense that we contrast that with the temporal nature of these sufferings, recognizing that uh, these difficulties aren't final, they aren't lasting, they're not permanent, that even if it lasts through our lives, that there's an end to it. And then we enter into eternity, and there we enjoy forever what God has for us. But it's also an eternal peace in that Paul says this was a peace that is for those whose names are written in the book of life. And so this morning, as you listen to this sermon, I would want to encourage you to, to know peace from God by having your name written in the book of life. That name is written there for you when you trust in Christ as your personal Savior. Secondly, in verse 10 through 13, Paul expressed how our circumstances are being used by God to change us. More often, we focus on getting God to change our circumstances. Verse 10, Paul acknowledges that he had endured a long time of difficulty in prison without anyone expressing care for him. But he recognized that the circumstances prevented, prevented them from being able to show care until more recently. He's not angry that they didn't show more care for him because they couldn't. He's simply rejoicing that now they can. Circumstances have changed for the Philippians, but not for Paul. Verse 11 and 12, Paul also points out that God is more pleased when we learn to be content with the circumstances that God has chosen for us. It brings great glory to God when we acknowledge that he is in control and has permitted everything in our lives just as it is. For Paul, it was to say something like this, I'm satisfied knowing that God has allowed me 
to be imprisoned, and that up until now, he's wanted me to endure it alone. God wants us to learn this same lesson and to learn it whether we have much or if we have little, whether we're comfortable or whether we're miserable. There's lessons to be learned in every set of circumstances. In verse 13, Paul goes on to say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And when he says that, he's meaning that he can rejoice in his circumstances and allow God to change him, whether they're good circumstances or bad circumstances. Often, when our circumstances are good, we forget God. But when we're suffering, we tend to cry out to God. Actually, we should be glorifying God in all of our circumstances. With Christ's strength, you can do exactly that. In these more difficult times of worry and loss and suffering, Christ can help you experience God's peace and allow God's work in changing you. And finally, in verse 14 to 20, Paul points out how the Philippians were such a blessing to him because they sacrificially gave to help him. However, they were also blessed in an even greater way. Remember in Acts, Luke records for us that Jesus had said that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Certainly, the Philippians did find joy in meeting the immediate needs of the Apostle Paul, but their greater blessing was in the eternal nature of what they did. Their gifts to him, Paul says, would produce spiritual fruit that had eternal value. Their gifts to him were like the Old Testament sacrifices, which were described as a sweet-smelling aroma to God that was acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Their gifts to him did meet some of his temporal needs. He describes them as necessities. They also helped meet some of his emotional needs. He says that they showed care for him and that they shared in his distress. And Paul says that these gifts from the Philippians produced praise to God and pleasure in God. Nothing much had really changed about Paul's circumstances, though. In verse 19, we read that in the same way that God met the need that Paul had without changing his circumstances, God can meet your need. He might provide food. He may provide clothing or money or a home. But he may also leave you sitting in the prison of your circumstances. He might allow you to have your emotional needs to be met, but only after a long period of time of hardship and possibly even the rest of your life, hardship. He might put you in a place of abundance health, pleasure, but still expect you to invest in eternal things and recognize the eternal value of those. God might not change your circumstances because he wants to change you. What you really need is for God to change you. Verse 20, the result of this is that God should be glorified forever. And that means beginning now. So here's some of our questions. Can God provide? Well, yes. I mean, we look in the Old Testament. We see God provide for the children of Israel in the wilderness wanderings. And he accomplished that through miraculous means. We read in the Gospels about the miracles that Jesus performed and in the epistles where the, the apostles perform miracles as well. And in fact, God is the creator of all things and he has no restriction. So can God provide? Absolutely, yes. He could provide anything and everything with no limits. But will God provide whatever I want? No, we don't always know what's best for us, and we're very selfish 
James says we often ask according to our own strong passions, our own strong desires. We too easily get focused on temporal things and we forget things that have eternal value. So God's not promised to give us whatever we want. He's promised to give us what we need. Number three, will God provide even if I've made bad choices in the past? Well, maybe. The Bible does tell us that we should count the cost and the wise person has oil in his house and the foolish person squanders all of that. And so we should be careful to make good decisions and yet know that God has not obligated himself to supersede our foolishness or our laziness in order to provide for our present needs. However, we've all made bad choices in the past and we're all right now enjoying God's graciousness. Humbly honor God's goodness in spite of your own foolishness and do not presume on God's graciousness for tomorrow's needs. Number four, has God promised to keep Christians from suffering? No. Temporal suffering is not always a sign of spiritual failure either. In fact, we see Christ suffered. He suffered hunger and thirst and sorrow and certainly physically suffered on the cross. And he experienced every part of what it is to be a human being, yet without sin. The disciples all suffered. In fact, their deaths were predicted by Christ, and ultimately they died for him. Peter writes to his audience in the book of 1 Peter and describes them as believers which have been scattered or dispersed abroad who are suffering for Christ. We read in the book of Acts of the saints in Jerusalem having suffered persecution and as a result of persecution and famine, some of them are starving and there's a need for the believers and other churches to help meet those needs that they have. So clearly, God hasn't promised that you won't suffer or that you'll live a life free from pain and misery. But God has promised to meet all the needs that he's deemed that you have. Number five, a better question might actually be, why would God provide for us? We act as though it's an unjust thing for us to get sick or lose our material wealth or to endure hardness, but all of these would be justified acts for, of, from God for people like us. Why would God ever show us kindness? Why would he keep us alive? Why would he grant us mercy? And the answer is because of who he is. We're not deserving of God providing anything for us. But we enjoy the fact that God, who is a merciful, gracious God, has abundantly poured out that goodness on us. So, finally, how will God provide? This verse, verse 19, tells us that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in mercy. God will provide in such a way to bring glory to himself while accomplishing his will in our lives. He'll do this by determining what our need is. He'll draw on the bank of his riches and he'll apply it through Christ's life-changing effect in us. It might be by changing our circumstances. Maybe God will Use the kindness of other people. Maybe he'll give us opportunities for work or for advancement in some way. It might be that God will improve our economy or change our environment somehow. But God may also change us through both good and bad circumstances. He may not change these circumstances at all for us and yet provide exactly what we need. Might God be using these circumstances to cause you to turn to him? Maybe today you need to turn to him in salvation, recognizing that your name has not been written in the book of life. 
Maybe you need to turn to him in these circumstances to honor him. Maybe you've been resisting, experiencing fear and anger and frustration, and today you would glorify God in these circumstances. Maybe you need to turn to God to serve him through these circumstances. How might God be trying to change you through these circumstances? Well, could you express trust in God that he has complete control of everything in your life? That kind of trust leads to joy so that truly you can rejoice in all things. Could you show contentment? That kind of contentment with whatever God has provided produces real peace. And then could you determine true value because of these circumstances? This kind of recognizing what really is valuable frees you up to invest in eternal things. You'll no longer be wasting your time and your energy and your resources for temporal things. You'll no longer be worried about um, just escaping your circumstances and changing things for the better, but you'll actually be thinking about eternal things and placing value in those. And lastly, in what way could you be a blessing to other people through these circumstances today? Well, I think, number one, you could be connecting and caring for other people. The Philippians were able to do that for the Apostle Paul. They had to put a lot of work and sacrifice and effort, and it took a long time, and it took sacrifice for those gifts even to be delivered to Paul. And Maybe through some of the electronic means or maybe in carefulness you can meet with people and, and uh, try to show your care and your connection with them in these present days. I think secondly, you could be a blessing to other people by praying for them. It's true that we all underestimate the power of prayer. In fact, we even show our lack of faith in God's ability to, uh, to impact change because of our prayers. And so I'm challenging you to truly consider the fact that you could spend time in prayer for other people and have a positive impact in their lives. And then finally, this is really a great time for our church to provide gospel hope. And when I say our church, it really truly is mostly you. You have the biggest responsibility to share this kind of hope to people that you come in contact with. You're coming in contact with fewer people, but make the most of those opportunities Maybe online, you're having a chance to provide encouragement and hope, maybe in person, maybe through phone calls. But what God has given us is a task in a time of distress and suffering and difficult circumstances to be the ones that can truly give the hope that the gospel brings. And so I'm challenging you to give hope to people, provide help to people in these times of distress by turning them to the truth of who God is. May God bless you.